I think I think that's why you know this conversation will be more fruitful because that's the question that we pose with regards to the universe. And as an engineer, you know, any time you see a piece of machinery or you see something, you've never said when you look at maybe something complex like a microwave, you'd never say that if this was left over millions and billions of years, it would just come by itself. So would I be, uh, tell me if there's another option. I say when it comes to what we see around us, we can conclude either it made itself, either it came from nothing, or either it was created. So are there any other options that maybe I've missed out or I'm trying to lead you somewhere? Yeah? Out of these, because you said Simon, yeah? So Simon, logically, let's, let's stick with logic. Sometimes people say, oh, what if I'm in the matrix? What if I'm in a dream? What if I'm here? What if I'm there? What if I'm here? What if I'm there? So we'll just, we'll just stick with just logic. What answer makes the most logical and common sense, yeah? So out of these three, to you, Simon, what makes the most sense to you? Uh, to me, I'm atheist. I don't believe in evolution or anything. Uh, sorry, I believe in evolution rather than uh, divine creation. Um, but bear in mind, evolution talks about organisms, isn't it? It doesn't talk about how matter and how organic and inorganic matter came into being. O o e evolution only deals um, with, of course, life forms evolving, change over time, mutation, etc., etc. So we're we're talking about the origin, the beginning. The origin of the first organic. Yeah, no, just just the beginning of everything that you see around yeah. you. Do you think, when you see everything, do you think that it created itself, like, like a rock? You're not going to say a rock evolved, isn't it? You're not going to yeah. say mountains or seas or stuff like that evolved. So would you say it created itself, came from nothing? Or it makes sense that something as complex as what we see and you as an engineer, that it makes logical sense that there could be a creator. I'm not saying there is, could be. The potential's there. I would say that there's as much evidence for that as there is for any other uh, explanation, but I would say that there's, uh, from my point of view, very little evidence of any explanation at all. But more so for it being created? Is that what you said? I'm saying there's equally little evidence for all explanations. Okay, interesting. But, I, but when we say that the universe created itself, logically that doesn't technically make sense. I wouldn't put them on, on an equal footing. Reason being the universe creating itself it's known as the cosmic bootstrap. It's like trying to pick yourself, yourself up using your shoelaces. Yeah. You see? So there's a logical contradiction in that sense, but also in the sense that uh, the universe, the universe created itself presupposes that there's a universe to begin with. You see? Yes. Yeah, I know. Um, I would say that... Yeah. So you'd probably say that's a bit less than the others, yeah? No, I would say that it has more evidence up until the point of the Big Bang and then before that there's, there's a point of singularity, so there's absolutely no data, time didn't exist. It is literally the beginning of creation, so uh, there is no evidence for anything before that because there was nothing to have evidence of. But the thing, Simon, is when you say evidence, what are we regarding as evidence here? Any record whatsoever. Am I correct to assume that you mean empirical evidence? Uh, is that what you regard as evidence in this conversation? Anything at all, any records, any... Uh, yeah, I guess it's very Empirical. Yeah. But would you also accept how even science doesn't rely solely on empirical evidence? Yeah. It will rely on other forms of evidence. Yeah, yeah. So when, I say this. Each one is, is equally little evidence to support that. Whether it's, you know, the Big Bang Theory is a large amount of scientific guesswork or whatever. So I think there's equally little evidence to support that as opposed to divine creation. So I'll, po I'll posit to you that out of the three options, and you can challenge me again, 
when when we look at what's around us during from our understanding rationally logically something creating itself doesn't rationally make sense it's just like like i mentioned something lifting itself or um, like a a mother giving birth to herself there has to be her mother and father that then you know they copulated then the mother became pregnant and then slowly you know keep going forward that's really loud uh abdul karim let's move let's too loud it's too loud yeah 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 should we just move back in That's what it boils down to in the end, isn't it? Like, you know, anytime oh, the questions, where did we come from, or where did this, where's that? Science, science deals with the how and religion. Um, so, because of science, and when science does try. There's certain rationality, logics for you to even get up in the morning and come to speak to corner. You have to acknowledge and appreciate that there has to be a key of uniformity, regularity, and stability for us to even do science. Just existence in the sense that, oh, Simon is walking down the street, you know, a tree flew and turned into what are you doing? Then Simon turned into the Loch Ness monster. People said, yo, and then suddenly appeared out of nowhere, as if from Pokeball. So it's it's ludicrous, it's ridiculous. But Simon, with all due respect, what I've noticed in the park is sometimes I'll have discussion with a lot of people that will claim to be rational, but the thing is they the rationale I'm not saying this is you but when it comes to everybody else or everything else, they'll say, you know what, you can't, I, I wouldn't agree or accept in my daily life things will just randomly pop into existence and pop out of existence. Yeah. Because that would lead to life becoming an absurdity. Yeah. Yeah? Or uh, things, uh, mothers giving birth to themselves without the father. The, there's been outrage. The father is furious, reported by CNN. Yeah. Yeah? We don't hear any of that. But when it comes to religion, we're so liberal with a small L, we're like, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm dreaming, maybe you're dreaming, maybe we're both collectively dreaming. Maybe I'm an egg, maybe you're, you know, this or maybe that. So uh, what I think is, I think when it comes to rationality, I think people withhold that when it comes to religion. That's why, and, and you're not going to be pinned down to anything. I just wanted to show you that if you follow the logical progression, even you will see that, you know what, logically, this did not come from nothing. Yeah. Logically, it did not create itself. It needed an entity. Now we can discuss the entity, as did philosophers in the past, like Leibniz and Aristotle and you know, Ibn Sina and these individuals. Or somebody might say, you know what? I have an issue with what the religious adherents do, not per se with religion itself. Do you see? Because sometimes it's the emotion that clouds the rationality, and people will will accept a multiverse but they won't be able to accept the universe yeah, that's right. they'll multiply the problem but they won't deal with the initial problem at hand do you see yeah. so do you see where i'm coming from yeah so rationally speaking we can acknowledge that there has to be that out of the three options 
the creator option makes the most sense. Even if I now go to another track and I say, let's go philosophically. There's three types of existence here. Yeah? Even if you were the biggest skeptic, you would say, okay, there's dependency, independency, and non-existence. I'm presupposing that if you're such a skeptic that you're saying, the only thing that I accept that exists um, is, is existence. Yeah, there is existence. Yeah. You accept there's existence, yeah. isn't it? Then would you say that there is dependent existence, independent existence, a dependent existence, independent existence, and impossible existence? Yeah, I guess so. When you say existence, do you mean existence of us? Yeah, consciousness or yeah, whatever we see around us. So, would you agree also? Sorry, were you going to say something? No, no. Okay. Would you would you also agree and accept that we and what you see around you is a form of dependency, dependent existence? That we're all dependent on something. Dependent on something being created or just dependent. Just dependent. On, yeah. I will be dependent on oxygen. A toaster is dependent on electricity and yeah, this and that. Gravity. Yeah, exactly. So now, here's the, here's the logical conundrum I want to pose. Yeah? Do you think that we can have an infinite regress of dependent things? What do you mean by infinite regress? I'll posit this as like an analogy. If I am to throw one of these microphones, because there's just so many of them, yeah? yeah. So let's just say I want to throw one of them. Yeah. But before I am to throw one of them, I have to ask his permission. He has to ask somebody else's permission, he has to ask someone else's permission, he has to ask... And it goes on ad infinitum. Would I ever get to throw the microphone? No. So logically, there has to be an end to that chain, which philosophically we call the necessary being. Yeah, not God, yet. We're just saying that this is the argument. Contingent, nece uh, necessary and impossible. I used the terms interchangeably of dependency and independency. Yeah, but the technical term is contingency, contingency and um, necessity, a necessary existence. So there has to be a necessary being at the end of that chain, otherwise we wouldn't necessarily exist. Yeah. Do you see? Just like I wouldn't be able to throw the microphone, we wouldn't exist if it was an ab, uh, ad infinitum of dependencies. With me so far, yeah? Okay, great. So this default position of accepting that there has to be an end to that chain, which is the necessary being, most philosophers haven't had an issue with. They're called deists. Yeah? Now the next step is that how do you now say that that necessary being is God? Which now you're wondering as well, like how is it going to jump from necessary being to God? Yeah? yeah? Okay, so let me just give you the criteria of, as Muslims, our criteria of God. Say he is God the one. This is in chapter 111. Yeah, so, or chapter 112, Surah Ikhlas. Say he is God the One, independent. He does not beget nor is he begotten, and there's none like him. That's our definition of a God. We don't believe that he is an old man with a beard, with a staff. We don't believe that he has a son that he sends down, you know, that dies. We don't believe that he's a blue individual with four arms and daggers. We don't accept or entertain that uh, at all. Yeah. Why? Because philosophically, rationally, in, in terms of inference, the best explanation, there has to be an end to that chain. The end to that chain has to be a necessary being, number one. Now, logically, that necessary being is independent because that, the end to that chain. They have to have a will because if they don't have a will, then they're contingent. They're not the end to that chain. They're a part of that chain. They have to have an immense amount of power because power by definition, you, uh, if we say something or someone has power, power by definition you get from something else. You can't just get power. Yeah. yeah? So these are, and then when we look at intelligence because there's intelligence and you know, complexity that logically infers that the necessary being also has intelligence. So that in a nutshell is our definition, the Muslim definition of a God. How does that sound logically and rationally to you logically from how I look at it? The dependence thing. You're yeah. talking about dependence on, for my existence, it's dependent on yes. my parents' existence, which is dependent on their grandparents' That's right. Existence. Or even in terms of oxygen, uh, in terms of food, nutrients. 
Yeah. All of these things are dependencies. Yeah. And so when you say the base of all that dependency is uh, like the, the being. Uh, the necessary being, necessary yeah. Being, isn't it equally as logical that that being doesn't have to be a being as such, but a, a set of laws? Like gravitational attraction is a law and it dictates that everything that happens within our universe, and there's entropy is a law, everything, everything becomes less ordered over time. Right. In general, nothing ever becomes more ordered. Interesting. Um, so it's a set of laws that define those dependencies so everything relates back to those laws which essentially defines the universe and it doesn't explain sort of the dependencies of what came first anymore um, it, 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 yeah it doesn't explain that part of your own hit it, it loses out there but how would you uh, yeah refute that in terms of um, yeah your, your, your belief so you think forces yeah yeah in terms of in a nutshell um, Fundamental laws, kind of thing. Fundamental laws, universe. right? How does that? Uh, how does that? Is that something that is at odds with your beliefs? Um, Not necessarily. You know, those would you say that those laws are, are below your uh, necessary being, or, or how, would, how, how, how does that fit in with your uh, your worldview? Yeah. Your, or uh, my point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when it comes to forces, forces are descriptive and prescriptive. They're not creative. Yeah. Forces don't create anything. Um, this was an argument posed by Stephen Hawking where he said the beginning of everything, you know, it came from gravity. Gravity is the beginning of everything. But that doesn't necessarily make sense because gravity doesn't do anything. Gravity is a law that we use to describe and, and, and prescribe things. Yeah. Yeah? For example, um, the law of arithmetic. That will never create money in my bank. Believe me, I've tried. <laughs> Uh, it rather explains it. Yeah. Me working and doing something, that's the only thing that will put money in my bank, not the law itself. Uh, for example, the law of motion, which you've probably studied in engineering, you know, there's someone playing snooker, pool or billiards. The law of motion is not something that moves. Um, that's what explains the ball moving, but it doesn't cause the ball to move. The cause of the ball to move is the individual hitting okay. the cue. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Would you say that? Uh, would you say that if the necessary being had its action at the start and then did nothing else for the rest of the time, would that explain? Uh, would that be something that makes sense, or like would that fit into your worldview, or is that? Do you think it's having a continuous effect? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> one of the criteria that we have for the necessary being, the characteristics. We believe that the necessary being is intelligent and from intelligence comes wisdom. So I talked about intelligence, I said because of the complexity and everything that we see around us, but that also, um, I, I think wisdom is logical as well. Uh, that the necessary being is, is wise. Now, if we accept the necessary being to be wise, it's not wise to create something complex and entire systems and forces and everything and just leave it yeah, yeah, with no purpose and just yeah. let it waft in space like a cloud of smoke yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah? yeah so that's our kind of uh, perspective um, for, from a Muslim because and the reason why I wanted to kind of clarify our definition of God because normally Simon you said yeah normally Simon people don't necessarily have an issue with a supreme being or a supreme power but it's how people interpret it like they say oh no he has a son or that the sun came down but then there's the eternal sin or, or, or there's this god the god of the sea and this and that that is something that causes issues that's why i wanted to break it down into like um the, the fundamentals that we accept now from there simon uh, is there anything else that you say maybe touch more upon this or that before i move on Okay, so then a, a sign of wisdom, I was looking into this as well. How would you say is the best form of learning as, as human beings? What's the best instrument that we have and the most effective instrument that we have to, to learn? Other than of course the faculties that we have or to, to disseminate knowledge. 
uh, so you're asking what the best format of learning the best, is? Yeah, the best medium of disseminating knowledge. Uh, I guess practical experience, doing something for yourself. Would okay. That's what we I would add one thing on top of that. Let's just say, if as a school teacher, because I used to be a school teacher, if I'm teaching something to a bunch of kids, um, and let's just say half the class is in, yeah. if I have to maybe every other day go over the same thing again and again and again and again, I'd be exhausted. So I would come up with like a bunch of worksheets as a school teacher. Yeah. But something more effective, and this is, you're probably familiar with this, in your engineering course, and this costs us a lot of money, which is to buy the texts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? <laughs> you know, and I looked at you, I could see the pain in your eyes because I remember when I had to get the books, they were so expensive, and some of the books I didn't even end up reading. Yeah, sure. So that, that was the, the, the sad reality, unfortunately. Yeah. So, going on with this, that God is all wise, He's intelligent, and an intelligent being creating something with a purpose wants to disseminate, wants to pass on wisdom, knowledge and the best way that I have come across is combination of oral and written. Because when it comes to written, it can be changed. As I'm going to posit, and I don't think any Christian has an issue with this, the, the Bible has many versions, but the Quran has one version yeah. yeah there's no multiple versions because it's coupled with the written word and the oral tra uh, tradition which is mo uh, there's a significant amount of muslims as young as six it's within our tradition to memorize the quran from beginning to end to such a degree that if every single holy book was burnt today for some reason the quran would be the only one that would be written down word for word that that's quite interesting isn't it and what's interesting also is the Quran is written in a language that's accessible to people. It's written in Arabic. And Arabic is the top five most spoken languages in the world. Yeah. If you look at the Old Testament, that's written in Hebrew. Hebrew is not widely spoken. The New Testament um, is based on Jesus. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Aramaic is not a live language. Um, the Vedas are written in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is not a live language. So if somebody claims that this is a book that's for humanity, for us to follow, even in these times, then it has to be something that's accessible, even objectively as well. And the Quran has manuscripts dated to the time of compilation, which none of the ancient religions claim. The Vedas don't claim that, the Old Testament and New Testament don't claim that as well. So if I'm saying and I'm making the claim that the Quran is the book till the day of judgment yeah, for us to benefit from and this holds the words of God, then surely God should be able to preserve it. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be one of your criteria for a holy book? Yeah, I guess so. yeah it makes sense, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I ask, but I feel that we're on the same page, but feel free to just jump in and go, mm, I wouldn't I have a bit of an issue with that. If I'm going too fast, tell me to slow down a little bit. Yeah. Sure. So the holy book, if somebody says, if you don't follow this holy book, the hell fire for you. I say, okay, how many versions is it? Yeah. There's five different versions. How, how does that work out? It's from God. Yes, it's from God. Which version? Yeah. I'm going to say my version. But with the Quran, even when you've got different sects, does the sects still accept the Quran? Yeah, it's the same book. Yeah, it's the same book. And there's only one unchanged yeah so that as a criteria that even a form of disseminating knowledge or passing on a message i would argue that the, the written word and, and i was pondering on this as well it makes the most sense simon because let's just say we're having a nice conversation reason why there's like seven different cameras here because there are people at home that are going to be watching this this conversation and benefiting from it so now we've got that but that relies on youtube <laughs> And just like um, there used to be, I think, MySpace that shut down, Vine, Vines, there used to be a, a website with Vines that shut down. So that's the thing with online, it can be changed. But with the written word, generally speaking, what you write down, you can kind of carbon date the ink, you can carbon date the manuscripts and the stuff like that as well. So there's a degree of accountability. And now with deepfake, 
when it comes to online stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's why. Do you see? It's not as reliable as people may, yeah. may say. Um, and fake news, people say, oh, no, that's fake news. I didn't say this or that. So the written word is something which is consistent amongst the religions. For a holy book, Simon, what would you say would also be criteria that's needed for you to say, you know what, for me to say that this is from God, here's the criteria that also needs to follow. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm not a religious guy, so... No, just, just you. Answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, to be honest. Okay, so preservation, of course. Tell me if you agree with some of the points that I'm saying. Number one, that the holy book should be preserved because if it's from God, and we're saying that this is the book that will determine your eternal fate, has to be something that's precise, exact. Make sense? Would you say that there also needs to be objective things in there? That you, Simon, that doesn't believe in religion, that you can go in there and use other criteria to measure it as well? Like, for example, historical proofs. So, you know that um, the Qur'an came after the Bible in, in order, isn't it? The Old Testament, then the New Testament, then the Final Testament. The Bible said at the time of Joseph, um, there were pharaohs. Yeah, the Qur'an came afterwards and it said, because some Christians claim that the, the Qur'an copied, yeah? But the claim or the, the rebuttal to that the Muslims say is no. We, we didn't copy or it wasn't copied. There's ample evidence to suggest that the Qur'an is its independent form, independent of the Bible. Yes, there might be certain similarities because, of course, we believe that um, Jesus was a prophet. We accept Jesus as a prophet. We accept uh, that th there was something called the Injil once upon a time as well, but it got changed. Um, so we have these, you know, we have no issues with these. But the Qur'an said at the time of Joseph, they were kings, not pharaohs. Mm -hmm. It makes that distinction. Yeah. So you can check this. It's, uh, you can check the references. So then what's interesting here is that at that time, the Rosetta Stone hadn't been unearthed. So this claim couldn't be checked. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of years later, I think, you know what? I think it was a thousand years. The Rosetta Stone was unearthed and it verified indeed at the time of Joseph, the pharaohs weren't there. They were kings. The Pharaoh dynasty actually started thereafter at the time of say Moses. Do you see? So that's what I mean by say historical evidence. That you can you can see yourself as well. You can very because the thing Simon, you know why this is helpful for you as well? Because this is gonna be going online. If I'm saying something just you know, just poking out my hat, I'm you know what I mean, I'll be checked many times <laughs> you see so these these claims that I'm making you know that this guy must, yeah, there yeah, must be yeah. some backing to it yeah. so that's historical evidence yeah. then there are prophecies in the Quran as well because you know if somebody comes and says oh I'm a prophet he says okay what's tell me your prophecies tell me this like Nostradamus who claimed that 2012 was was going to be the last year yeah. do, you, do you know of that yeah, prophecy yeah, yeah. yeah. So with Nostradamus, the thing with his prophecies are they were very vague. Yeah. yeah, but the Prophet, peace be upon him, he made very specific and particular prophecies. And these are prophecies that can be checked um, yourself as well. That you can see, okay, what date was the Prophet alive from this date to this date? Yeah. Okay, when was the prophecy made and when was this discovered? For example, the Prophet at his time, 1400 years ago, he said there will come a time that the barefoot unclothed herdsmen will be competing with each other to build the tallest buildings. Now at the time of the Prophet, and then he was asked, who are these individuals that you're referring to? He said, the Bedouins, i.e. the Bedouins of the desert. At that time, the Arabs were the low of the low. Yeah, they were not, there were two major empires. You had the Byzantines, you had Persia, Rome, uh, sorry, the Romans, the Persians, um, I think the Sassanids, but these were the main empires at that time, not the Arabs. Yeah, not the Arabs. However, um, I think it's only recent, within I think the last hundred odd years, that oil was discovered in Saudi or in the Arabian Peninsula by an American no less. 
yeah? Um, so it's claimed. And then that's now referred to as black gold oil, yeah? And that changed the landscape of the Middle East, yeah? To such a degree that now if you look at the buildings that are the tallest, you've got the Makkan clock tower, and the tallest building in the world right now is? No idea. The Burj Khalifa, yeah? In Dubai. You've heard of that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very famous New Year celebrations that's always shown. And Saudi is now building something called the Kingdom Tower. And I think um, either Indonesia is building another one. So these are all to do with the Middle East or the East. Yeah, It's the Muslims competing with each other to build the tallest buildings. Yeah. Whilst once upon a, but do you see how specific it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Prophet could have referred to all the rich Arabs or the Persians, but he made very specific points even when it comes to other things at his time like you might say a point that you might say is this is circular reasoning you you might claim a prophecy that can only be proven by muslims uh, to prove islam do you see were you thinking that yeah so there was one prophecy where the prophet peace be upon him uh, predicted that the byzantines who were losing so badly at that time at the, hand, at the hand of the Persians to such a degree that their leader Heraclius was just being embarrassed. Constantinople fell, the, the, the capital fell, uh, a plague had bro broken out and they were losing terribly. Prophet peace be upon him said, I think from six to nine years, the Byzantines will win. Now this is a date specific and people specific. Now what happened then was Obviously, we're going to make the claim that's exactly what happened. But you're going to say, yeah, but you're a Muslim. <laughs> you're a Muslim making that claim. But I will direct you to a primary source of a non-Muslim, someone called Theophanes. He wrote a collection called the Chronicles of Theophanes. You can check that up. And he references that particular victory of the Byzantines during that exact period. So the point that I'm trying to tell you is, you know, in even in science, there's an accumulation of evidence. For example, we were talking about the Big Bang. When you talk about cosmic background radiation, when you talk about redshift, when you talk about um, you know, the illumination of the stars, because if there's steady state theory, then there's so many stars. And at the night sky, if we look up at the night sky, there should be so many stars and should be more illuminated than it already is. So there's an accumulation of evidence that's put forward for the Big Bang. That's generally how it works. And then science makes the inference to the best explanation. You're familiar with that, isn't it? Like it, it's based on induction. In other words, if I'm conducting an experiment, I say, okay, here in the UK, in my area, I've seen swans. All swans are, you know, I've seen like a thousand swans. All swans are white that I've seen. Someone in India, he says the same thing. Someone in Thailand says the same thing. Okay. That's like 3,000 in three different um, areas. It's enough for us to conclude all swans are white. That's how induction works in science. That's one of the kind of main things. Yeah. Now, science is open to being disproved as well. Here, yeah? Yeah. So when somebody discovers a black swan, then it's been falsified, isn't it? It's called the falsification test. Yeah. Now, the Quran also has a falsification test as well. And you can try this out, yeah? The falsification test of the Qur'an, which is in line with empiricism, is that if there's a contradiction in it, then naturally it wouldn't be from God. If you believe it's from other than God, then there should be loads of contradictions in it. And now I'm standing in Speaker's Corner, anybody can come and batten me over the head and say there's this contradiction, there's that contradiction. Have you come across such a big contradiction that people have said, this is the end of Islam? This contradiction is so big that Islam has come and, you know, seas of people leaving Islam because of a contradiction so bad. Have you come across something like that? No, I haven't studied it. Yeah. Otherwise, even, you know, sometimes when we're scrolling through TikTok, so like, aha, we've caught the Muslims. You'd see loads of the, these videos, but you don't. Why? Because there's, there's, there's nothing that's been posited that, that is like the smoking gun. That was the word I'm looking for. The smoking gun contradiction 
So when it comes to a falsification test, the Quran has it. When it comes to preservation, the Quran has it. When it comes to prophecies, the Quran has it. Now, Simon, my point to you is you're obviously going to be speaking to people of other religions. You're going to be researching yourself as well. You have the Quran. You took a copy of the Quran, isn't it? Yeah, so you're going to be reading it yourself as well. You know when you're walking down the street or uh, you're going here and there, is there any other religion that is so blasé about just dishing out free copies of the Quran left, right and centre? Uh, I mean, in every hotel room in Australia, there's a Bible in there. There's a Bible, but they don't say take that Bible home with you, it's a free copy. Yeah, I mean, but it's there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, we're so confident with the Quran, like even over here, Speaker's Corner is not a Muslim country. Yeah, it's not a Muslim country. <laughs> but Speaker's Corner is Hyde Park, central London. But you will see, I don't think there's a single stall here giving free copies of the Bible, free copies of the Vedas, free copies of the Guru Granth. The Quran is the only one being distributed. It shows like a certain ballsy nature. You know what? We're so confident. Take it. Take it, it's free. It's like people giving free samples of something. Yeah, hey, take a free sample and, and when you're taking it, I'm like, oh, he might not like it. Like, hey, you know what? Take this, mate, and take this as well, mate. Yeah, like DJ Khaled says another one. Yeah, take this, mate. So it's so confident about our religious scripture. We take it, mate. Yeah, so this again, and even now you'll see Simon, and I'm open to be proven wrong, the most relevant religion that's being discussed nowadays is Islam. When it comes to talking about moral issues, when it comes to talking about practical issues, when it comes to talking about political, economic issues, because as Muslims, I'll tell you, Islam came to preserve five things. Yeah, one, religion, i.e. monotheism. Islam is the, claims to be the only religion that's purely out of the ancient religions, that's purely monotheistic. The rest, there'll be some aspect of non-monotheism in there. Next, Islam came to preserve life. That's why in the Quran there will be verses like you kill one individual unjustly. It's as if you have killed the whole of mankind. Yeah. Then intellect. Alcohol. Nah, but I'm just having the knees up with the lads, you know. No. Forbidden. Nah, but what a little sip, you know. So, so. No. Forbidden. No, nah, but a bit, a bit of that, you know. Need a bit of that energy, that boot. No, none of that, mate. No, but what? Intellect. Intellect. Some people do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the but the book doesn't say that, though, innit? Yeah. 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 You got me. You got me. So the book doesn't say that. He's right, though. He's right. Some people will do that, and that's why I'm not here to defend Muslims. I'm here just talking about Islam. So. Intellect, it affects a person's intellect, like drinking and driving. Yeah. Or somebody doing drugs, it impairs their senses when they're driving, when they're doing other things, they'll make poor judgments. Yeah, yeah. yeah? sometimes even in the city, they'll make bad investment yeah, yeah. choices. We're in the city now, because yeah. they've been doing the old lines here and there, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, intellect, Islam came to preserve. Intellect, life also I mentioned. Family, yeah, adultery. Uh, disloyalty in relationships is seen very seriously in Islam. Yeah. Why? Because two people that are committed to each other, if that relationship is destroyed, it affects the children that are, limit, uh, that are linked to that. Statistics tell us that a child who comes from a broken home is more likely to be obese, more likely to you know, abuse drugs, more likely to become a bane for society. Those people that are coming from that broken home they're more likely to be banes for society as well. Uh, individuals in that relationship, they're more, more likely to be scarred, tra traumatized. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, because I'm into psychology as well. Um, I see this. It's a basic, it's a major part of the, the spectrum of trauma that people go through, these relationships. And also a major contributor to males committing suicide are, you know, bad relationships, yeah? So, and the last thing is money.
wealth. Islam came to preserve wealth. And that's why interest. Islam has a big issue with interest. Yeah. Why? Because interest makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. Now, naturally speaking, Islam is not going to be promoted by everybody because most of these things that I've mentioned, they are major industries. The alcohol industry, the gambling industry, uh, you've, you've got um, the banking system relies on interest. You know what I mean? And uh, of course, irreligiosity helps because then that, with that gap when it's there, you fill it with materialism. So those are the five main things that Islam comes. So what do you think about what I've said so far in terms of, say, Islam's relevance, in terms of maybe the issues that maybe you have with what's going on, what's going on in society and you wonder if Islam has a solution for that? Like, what are your thoughts so far? Uh, I mean, I agree with all the basic points of, um, like, I don't really drink much, etc. Don't gamble, don't gamble. But I don't think, uh, for me at least, uh, Islam is... I don't think my solutions to that come through religion, they're just based on my moral purpose. Okay, brilliant. Now, here's the thing. I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to go. Okay, no worries, but no worries. It was I really nice speaking it. to you. Yeah, it was yeah, nice yeah. no, you. thanks for your time. Yeah. And uh, hopefully I'll be here next week or whenever you get a chance, just drop by. Awesome. Yeah, Thank thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay, and I just chop it off. Off, off, off that camera. You want to talk off camera, yeah? Just, 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 yeah, 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 that's fine, yeah, yeah. Bro, we got to do something about these, man. It's, there's, there's so much. What some people do?